<laughs> Can you believe some fans are actually like publicly bemoaning the fact that this fight got put together because like they don't want one of their favorites to lose? Like, come on! It is UFC 271 fight week. So uh, special guest today is the one and only, the voice of the UFC, the man, the play-by-play -play man, John Anik. Sir, how are you? Oh, it's great to be with you, man. I didn't realize just how young and handsome you actually were. We've been communicating, obviously, over text for years, and we've done interviews for years, but uh, nice to see your face, man. And uh, first time I'm cracking a mic, actually, for this pay-per-view week, so I'm excited. Yeah, well, I, I feel honored, and, and uh, obviously, thank you for that. I, your camera might be off. It might be, there, there, there might be some issues with your camera, but, uh, you know, right before, you know, you got on here, you know, the best thing for me to always do, and you know, as a podcast, as you know, as a researcher, as a guy who perfects his craft, you, you got to, I wanted to hear everything you had to say about the last Izzy and, and Robert Whitaker fight, Israel Adesanya, Robert Whitaker. So I, I brought up UFC 243 at Marvel Stadium in Melbourne. And you, you really talked about a lot about that atmosphere. And who would have guessed when, you know, we walked out of that arena that night that we would have this pandemic and two years later, here we are. And they're running it back. And now the world is a, a completely different place. But we go back to that night, that unification middleweight title fight in Melbourne, Australia at Marvel City. What was that like for you out of all the fights you've called in, in your career? It was a crazy live event experience. I don't know that I have a point of comparison. You know, I went to, I think it was UFC 129 at Rogers Center in Toronto, but I was covering that event for ESPN and I wasn't really doing a whole lot of work. So to call an event at that stadium, which was so vast, it, it's almost indescribable in terms of, of the venue and the pageantry and Izzy's walkout and everything else. Um, but all of that felt elevated because, and I don't have to tell you this, it felt like one of the biggest middleweight championship matchups in UFC history. And I know people get upset when I speak in superlatives and historical terms, but when you look at the body of work now of both of these men, what Izzy has done since and successfully defending the belt three times, Whitaker in some respects reinventing himself, but I think that's probably a stretch. Uh, I cannot wait, you know, you know, and that's why you're over the moon excited for this main event this weekend, regardless of what it does on pay-per-view. This is one of the biggest championship matchups in any division that we can put together. There's heat on it. Uh, I can't wait. I can't effing wait. I'm with you. And, you know, I really can't wait more so because I was in the building for Romero Whitaker too in Chicago. And I'll never forget you know, being, you know, a freelancer, I was going down to the fight hotel every day, just trying to get interviews off on the side and see who I could find and who I could grab. And on fight day, I saw Robert Whitaker walking out of his room through the hotel. And I was like, not even going to obviously consider talking to him at that point, but just watching him, just watching him walk. I was like, that's, that's how a champion walks. And you think about how that fight was with Romero and all these circumstances, Romero being pulled, after, you know, during weight cutting, after being short 0 0.2 pounds, like just the craziness that could throw anybody off of their game. Never mind the fact he's going in there against Yoel Romero. And, you know, he put on the performance that he did. And I, I just, you know, that for me kind of set the stage. And we've seen everything that Israel Adesanya has done throughout his career. You called him after that fight against Robert Whitaker, the standard of 185 pounds. And it's very hard to argue that. I know he had the failed attempt at light heavyweight and, you know, people are going to say what they want about that. But when you call him the standard, what does that really mean to you in terms of how you classify Israel Adesanya? Well, all of his title defenses have been dominant, right? And yeah. at this point, he's undefeated in the weight class, 20 and 0 or 21 and 0, whatever it is, only professional losses at light heavyweight. And I think Robert Whitaker is a Hall of Famer. And it took him less than nine minutes to beat that guy. And he did so pretty decisively. Now, certainly this week, you're going to hear a lot of people picking Whitaker apart, taking issue with some of his recklessness or reckless abandon in the first fight. Um, but Adesanya is a special, special striker. And some people get criticized for like giving him too much credit. And then you have another group of people that can't wait to see Alex Pareda, who's very green in MMA, knock him off the perch like next week, you know? <laughs> um, so 
I just, I just think there's a special undeniable quality to Adesanya in our fighter meeting in the octagon. And I just like the fact that he wants all of the most important scalps on his resume. That's why he wanted Romero or Anderson Silva or Paulo Costa, who people like me thought was going to be the UFC middleweight champion, you know? So I love that he's fighting Whitaker a second time. I think both guys end up in the hall of fame. And uh, again, I mean, I don't think Whitaker should be plus 225. Right. <laughs> any man in the world. But if you're asking me who needs to be more perfect on Saturday night, I think it's Whitaker, even if he has more ways to win. I think he has to be more perfect. And that's why I think that, uh, that Adesanya gets this distinction, albeit shouldn't be that high, but as, as a pretty big favorite. I, I couldn't agree more. And I think two more on these two guys, and I'll just talk really quickly about the rest of the card. But with uh, Israel Adesanya, when you have a guy who has all these, you know, the, the title defenses that he has and the personality that he has, we saw that, you know, the attempt to go up to 205, it didn't go his way. But what does it do for you as a guy in the seat that you are in, in the pilot seat that you are driving for every event, being around all these fighters, when you have a guy like, and we saw it like a guy like a Habib Nurmagomedov. Yes, he was undefeated. Israel Adesanya is not. But when you have a champion who's just running through and through and through, we saw it. We saw it in December. We saw that the champions can be dethroned when we thought they couldn't with Amanda Nunes and Juliana Pena. But from the middleweight division and, and such a historic division, what does Israel Adesanya's legacy mean to that division? You know, it's a great question. And I think sometimes people get frustrated when we try to speak legacy or speak in historical terms, as I mentioned, when a guy might have 10 to 12 UFC fights left. Now, I don't know if Adesanya is going to have that many fights left, but in a lot of respects, he's just getting going, even though he's accomplished a lot of great things. You know, this sport is crazy. It's so unpredictable. Um, not like slip on a banana peel unpredictable necessarily. And I like the Ray Donovan hat, by the way. Thank you. Um, but the whole legacy can kind of change on a dime this weekend. Can it not? You know, Adesanya needs closure this weekend. If he can finish Robert Whitaker or beat him 49-46, 50 to 45, he closes out this series. And in terms of Robert Whitaker trying to become a two-time UFC middleweight champion, this would amount to probably an 18-month, if not two-year championship setback at minimum. Whitaker's going to go have to win at least a couple fights and hope that somebody can knock out Asanya off the perch. Whitaker wins. We're looking at a trilogy, you know, depending on the, the style points with which Whitaker wins, maybe you know, people start to knock Adesanya. I think it's a stretch to talk about Adesanya in a conversation with Anderson Silva right now, just based upon the length of Anderson Silva's reign and how dominant it was. Um, but I would almost turn it back to you and say, which middleweight has challenged Adesanya the most, you know? Um, and I don't know what the <laughs> yeah, I don't know. there is, right? I mean, Marvin Vittori would tell you it's him going away. You know, some people would say, it was Rob Wilkinson who attempted a million takedowns in Izzy's UFC debut. Um, I think his most competitive fight is going to be this weekend, and uh, and I'm excited for it. Yeah, no, and I think the best part about that is something you mentioned is actually on my notes. I was going to ask exactly the the way you you put it, the reinvention of Robert Whitaker, if you want to call it that. I mean, you think it just a guy got healthy and took some time off, and he just did what we know him to be great at. Yeah, maybe not as reckless in the last couple of fights, but he's still the Reaper, right? He's still Robert Whitaker. And for, for you, how do you see him coming into this? Right, has there been dra quote unquote drastic changes to, to Robert Whitaker? Or do you think he, it just, he went at his best pace now? Another good question. I don't think it's been drastic changes, um, but the numbers would tell you that it has, right? right. Oddshark.com's Joe Osborne brought this to my attention on our podcast earlier this week that Whitaker has landed 22 takedowns in his last three fights after landing one in the three fights leading into the first Adesanya fight. So the numbers would tell you that he's mixing it up a lot, a lot more. He's going for takedowns a lot more. Um, but let's say he had to fight Izzy in a kickboxing match this weekend. How does he do? Might win the goddamn thing. Could do pretty well, right? So yeah. I don't think he's going to force takedowns. I think he's going to have to be very clean in transition. I think what a lot of us are curious to see is if he is able to take out Asanya down, which is certainly no guarantee. Um, physically, how does he hold up? Is he stronger? Can he keep him there? Um, 
you know, can he get to the positions that he likes to be in on the ground to potentially set up a submission? You know, Adesanya's never been submitted, you know, and the Bohovich fight was closer than Justin Gaethje thinks it was. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm glad someone agrees with me. I didn't think it was like a blowout for you. Well, let me say this. So, obviously, the broadcast team was criticized more so than I think Joe DC and I have ever been criticized for bias in that fight. And I don't have to tell a friend like you that we call it like we see it. I mean, there is right. absolutely no bias. You know, I married into a Polish family. Okay. Like there's plenty of Jan Blachowicz in my heart, but Kenny Florian thought Adesanya won that fight 48, 47. Right. And that opinion from a guy who three times fought for a UFC title, I guess would dovetail more with our, our fight call uh, than public opinion. Um, but I thought that fight was closer than people did. And um, you know, I don't, the blueprint talk is silly, right? We're talking about a, a middleweight fight versus a light heavyweight fight, so. Right, exactly. Uh, so moving on with that card, UFC 271, we are going to see a fan favorite, not a casual favorite, because that's that's their own fault, but a fan favorite, and Roxanne Mataferi will be her retirement fight. But what a step up for her uh, opposition in Casey O'Neill, who maybe necessarily Roxanne Mataferi isn't the one that gets you to a title, but it's really almost a showcase for Casey O'Neill if she can continue to do what she's doing uh you know in her career but like let's not disrespect roxy like i mean she's she's been a world beater she's been an uh, you know an upset queen if you will but what do you make of roxanne modafferi's career and how she you know matches up against casey o'neill you know casey looks like a beast and you know we have to be careful with that word showcase right but i would call this a showcase fight for casey o'neill I'm pretty honored and humble to get the chance to call Roxanne Modafferi's last MMA fight, if I'm being honest. I do believe if she got VPKI surgery early in her career, um, she might have been an even better fighter because it's hard for her to see in there. And I say that somewhat tongue in cheek, but what a legacy, right? And to be able to add signature wins that she's added late in her career over fighters against whom she wasn't given any sort of modicum of a chance, really special career. Not a Hall of Famer in the UFC, of course, but really cool to see her fight for a UFC title, um, to see her represent mixed martial arts in such a positive, unique way. Um, I feel pretty convicted in saying there's not going to be another Roxanne Modafferi. And, uh, you know, I'm happy that she's getting the shine on a pay-per-view card, just going out like a champion, you know. Um, and I definitely think she brought a lot of people to the sport, right? who maybe were surprised to see her involvement in it and her success in it. So um, she's really cool. You know, I haven't worked many of Casey's fights, so I'm very excited to see her fight live. And uh, yeah, man, we're loaded. I mean, this yeah, is- Yeah, no, absolutely. I got like two more here and then I want to give you an uh, opportunity to talk about the podcast real quick. But yeah, no, I'd say this, you know, Roxanne Modafferi even, I'll take it a step further, what she did for women's MMA. You know, and if you look at, obviously there's, there's the superstars, right? And we can name them all. But I think Roxanne Mataferi fits in her own specific class where, you know, and maybe she's not the poster child or poster woman of women's MMA from a, from a physical standpoint, from a marketing standpoint. But that gives another whole class of women to look at this and go, I don't need to be this sex symbol to sell fighting. I can be myself. I can be, yeah. you, you know, and it's one thing I've always admired about Roxanne Mataferi. And I think on the outside, that fits to her fighting style because she doesn't care what you want to see or what you think. She's going right. to go in and she's going to master her craft and she's winning these big fights. I mean, I, yeah. I just absolutely love Roxy Fighter. She's, a, she's yeah. amazing. And I feel an obligation when I'm calling a fight that involves like Alexis Davis or Sarah Kaufman um, to really let people know that. You know, and of course, Roxy. Right. But, you know, look what Alexis Davis is still doing. You know what I mean? Right. Pretty cool. Uh, we're aligned. And, and I'm going to give Roxy some extra shine for you this weekend. <laughs> Ken here and uh, Derek Brunson. I mean, Derek Blonde Brunson. I mean, I, I was thinking, like, do I need to dye my hair blonde? Maybe I'll get a step up in life and a career path. Yeah, like, yeah. I mean, I mean, we talked about reinventing Robert Whitaker. Maybe it's just need, need some hair dye. I mean, this is this is a fight. You know, we've heard Izzy calling for a fight with Jared Kennan here. I know Derek Brunson. It's it's amazing for me to see on the Brunson side when you have a guy so fired up to go get that loss back and the way Derek Brunson has done his last few fights. I think this is a, a massive, massive fight, you know, for the future of this division. Yeah, it is. It's a title eliminator for sure. I'm curious to see where the betting line will close because all of the handicappers that I have talked to this week, three of them, 
all picked Eric Brunson plus 155. I don't have to tell you he's won five in a row. Maybe you don't know that he's done that and they've all been underdogs. You know, he's been an underdog in each of those five fights. His confidence is just unshakable right now. And I think his alignment with Sanford MMA is certainly a part of this. You know, I think there's been a different strength and conditioning commitment from Derek as well. But I really think it comes down to confidence. You know, um, nobody was giving him a chance fighting Edmund Shabazian. And, uh, and even this weekend, if you look at the betting odds at plus 155, the odds makers are still doubting. And I led my answer with my curiosity for where the betting line closes, because are these people going to put their money where their mouths are on Derek Brunson? As yet, that hasn't happened. So what percentage of bets are going to be on Brunson? What percentage of handle? I don't know. Um, Cannoneer's a little bit injury prone, but he's an absolute beast. I mean, he can knock your effing head off. Um, I think Brunson's going to try to wrestle him. And uh, obviously, Cannoneer is, is very talented on the ground. Um, you know, I think it could very well be a 15-minute war. That's what I'm preparing to call. Um, but again, style points. Trite as that may sound, always useful. You know, Sean Strickland almost publicly acknowledged the fact that maybe he could have used more style points in his recent win over Jack Hermanson. Um, and you can be sure for Brunson, for Cannoneer, uh, this is a golden opportunity. You get a finish on pay-per-view, two fights before the title fight, probably fighting the winner, unless it's Whitaker and we go trilogy. <laughs> well, all that sets the stage before the title fight for I, what I have to say in, in recent memories, got to be the biggest fan favorite fight the UFC has put together in a long time with Ty Tuovas and Derek Lewis. I mean, either someone's got hot balls or someone's drinking out of a shoe. Ah. I mean, I just, I, I couldn't, it, and it's crazy because you want to love them both. And they each have crazy knockout power obviously Derek Lewis holds the most knockout records in UFC history but yeah. Ty Tulvasa can knock out anybody yeah I mean this is a massive massive step up in competition for Ty Tulvasa you know no pun intended in the heavyweight division but I would almost say like can you talk me out of and talk fans out of worrying about Derek Lewis and sometimes his ability and I guess really bad ability to start to hesitate in these fights well, and fighting in Houston, he has publicly yeah. acknowledged he does not like fighting at home. I think he's happy this is a three-round fight and not a five-round fight, um, but he would much prefer uh, to be fighting in San Antonio, if not out of state. <laughs> Can you believe some fans are actually, like, publicly bemoaning the fact that this fight got put together because, like, they don't want one of their favorites to lose? Like, come on! I'm a little bit surprised at the calendar that both of these guys fought in December and are immediately making the turn. Um but Tui Vasa has embraced the grind, another cliche, right? But he finally is embracing training and not having negative emotions when it comes to a lot of the preparation and the results have followed. And yes, it's a step up in competition, maybe not as pronounced as some think it is. Um, you know, I think Ty has sort of methodically built himself up to this point. You know, there were a lot of people, handicappers picking Augusto Sakai in that fight, if you if you yeah. remember. Um, so, you know, I think Ty is going to be the busier striker, to your point. I think that uh, he's going to try to work leg kicks. I do think the Houston pressure is not ideal for Derek, and I'm very interested to sit down with Derek in our fighter meeting because when we sat down with him prior to the Seattle Gone fight at UFC 265 in Houston, um, you could tell mentally he was not where he needed to be. And it wasn't because he thought Gone was – you know, right. a world beater, right. because yeah. he was afraid of fighting in Houston. So uh, afraid is probably the wrong adjective. But yeah, there are a lot of different layers to that fight that I think would make Tui Vasa a live, a live underdog in that plus 160 range. I should know this answer, but I'm going to ask it anyways. Whether on camera or off camera, how many shoeys has John and Nick done in his life? At least one on camera. Um, <laughs> I got to think I've done at least two shoeys in my life. And I have agreed because someone asked me to to do a shoey on the Anakin Florian podcast next week if Tuivasa wins. Love it. But again, like the spitting in the shoe is my only issue. Yeah, right? yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I draw the line there. But if it's my own spit, right, that's different than it being someone else's spit, you know. And then, I mean, I, I hate to get all you know rated R on you, but some people are now saying that it's got to be like a loogie, right? So when I did a shoey, Mike, it was 
it was not a loogie. It was my own spit. It was basically saliva. It was a very little bit of spit and it was a brand new shoe of mine. So I think maybe next week, if Tui Vasa wins, I have to go with a used shoe. Um, and, you know, I'm going to keep the spit ratio the same. I absolutely love it. Now, just a couple more here for you, John. I really do appreciate all your time. Uh, we did mention that, you know, the, this heavyweight fight. And uh, we obviously saw Francis Ngannou defend his title against Cyril Gan. We saw John Jones recently call out a fight for Steve, uh, against Stipe Miocic in the heavyweight division. Who knows if that's going to happen? Just in a, in a short, quick answer, if you can, what is the future of this heavyweight division? Oh, so I think that if you put an interim belt on the line, John Jones and Stipe makes sense, right? If you are under the assumption that Francis Ngannou is going to resign and he's going to miss nine to 12 months, you got to put an interim belt on the line, I think, to get Stipe to the table, right? Because he's one and one with Francis Ngannou and he has certainly been biding his time, right? He fought Daniel Cormier once a year, right? So I think you're going to have to put a belt on the line, but that's the fight that I would like to see. I would love to see it headline International Fight Week. I want to see Curtis Blades fight Cito Gan because I think that that's a test that Cito Gan is going to have to pass eventually. Why not now? Um, and that's, I think, the immediate future. Obviously, Tom Aspinall and Alexander Volkov is a big fight that's coming up. And, and certainly if Aspinall is the one to emerge there cleanly, uh, then he would be a guy that would factor in this mix. But um, yeah, I, you know, I am much more in favor of interim championship belts than most because I think I understand the inner workings maybe a little right. bit more acutely. Um, but Steve Bay and John Jones is a dream fight for me. And uh, I hope, I, ho I hope uh, cautiously optimistic that we can headline International Fight Week with that belt. That would be absolutely amazing. Now, I, I wouldn't be able to let you go without two things. One, thank you for the Ray Donovan compliment. I, I don't own Boston sports gear. Um, you know, from my time living right outside New York City, I won't do it. I am a Knicks fan, even though I live in Chicago. Yeah. So I was like, what is the best thing I can do to honor you? I had to wear Ray Donovan and, you know, the great people at Showtime sent me this. So, and it's for my money, one of the best shows ever. Um, I absolutely loved how they ended it with the movie. I hated how the series ended. They capped it off perfectly in the movie. But uh, you talked a little bit. Of, I know we're, I'm getting off topic here, but you talk about all this stuff on the Anna Florian podcast and then everybody can go to the Anna Florian podcast.com. I know you guys just released a, a UFC 271 preview just a few hours ago. So I wanted to plug that for you. I know you're doing great work with DraftKings as well with a UFC fan contest. Like what are the, like what drives you to have a podcast when you have single-handedly the most important job on fight? Well, it's certainly, uh, adds to my fight week in terms of the hours right and we're taping it on Sundays now which helps my workflow a little bit um but I have said repeatedly that it's the best way to, for me to give back to the fans like it will never be behind a paywall of that I can assure you um I will fight like hell to keep that as free content it's also an outlet for me selfishly to be able to get some things off my chest after a big pay-per-view uh but it's been the number one way that I've been able to connect with fans because at live events, obviously my time is limited and I feel a real connection with the fans through the podcast. So it's been a great outlet for us. And, uh, you know, obviously I got into the podcast space because of Joe Rogan and we're coming up on our seven year anniversary, which is pretty crazy. So, uh, I appreciate that. And real quick, I will say, um, I just have been working with Modelo as a spokesperson for them. DraftKings.com slash Modelo. If you would like to enter, to win floor seats to 10 pay-per-views, 10 consecutive pay-per-views. You get two floor seats, ton of behind the scenes stuff with me as well. If that piques your interest, come into our dressing room, come onto the television set, uh, be in my hotel room with me, watching me do voiceovers. That stuff's all cool, but this is the greatest sweepstakes in professional sports history. Two floor seats to 10 consecutive UFC pay-per-views. So that, that, doesn't make you, that doesn't make you a fan of the year. That doesn't make you a fan of the year. I don't know what you need to do. I will definitely put that in the description. It's drafting draftkings.com slash modelo. I mean, like you said, best, best sweepstakes in professional sports history. But before I let you go, Tom Brady called it a career last week. John Anik, I mean, how do you sum up the, the I mean, I was born in 92. So so ignorantly, I will say I was just a little little kid when Jordan was in his prime. Yeah. So for my money. 
Tom Brady's the greatest professional athlete I have seen and, and probably the most accomplished, if not the greatest, definitely the most accomplished. What do you say on Tom Brady and his career? Well, the quarterback position is the most demanding position in professional sports. Don't talk to me about a shooting guard, right? So <laughs> bias aside, and, and as a New York Knicks fans, I, I would never expect you to wear any Boston sports gear. So we appreciate uh, the gesture with the Ray Donovan hat. Um, but, you know, there are a lot of people that are pretty sad and going through some emotions with Tom Brady retiring. To me, it's all happiness. I guess my only disappointment, if you want to call it that, is that he didn't regress at all. And that's awesome for him to go out after a season in which he led the NFL in passing yards. But if you look at his last touchdown pass to Mike Evans, the deep ball that he threw, most of the quarterbacks in the NFL can't put it there. You know, like he's one of the best deep ball throwers now in the NFL. And to retire at the top of his game at 44, to me, is a little bit crazy. So I guess I would have liked to have seen a little bit of performance regression before he walked away. But time to spend time with the kids. And uh, yeah, I mean, greatest professional athlete of my lifetime for sure.